Hey everyone, Dr. Whitney Costers, professor of English, here to lecture on Margaret Atwood's 1985 dystopian novel, The Handmaid's Tale. If you are interested in getting the breakdown and analysis of a variety of canonical literary texts, then please subscribe to my channel because I upload lectures weekly. Now, to say that The Handmaid's Tale is an incredibly loaded novel with much to consider is an understatement. So I've decided to break up this lecture into smaller separate videos in which I can focus on a certain theme or topic. In this video, I wanna discuss some of the religious and biblical context of the novel because one of the points that Atwood has made repeatedly about The Handmaid's Tale is that it is speculative fiction or fiction that has a basis in historical events or political ideologies that have already come to Pass. In other words, The Handmaid's Tale is especially terrifying because the very things that have come to fruition in Gilead can easily happen to us because they already have happened at some point in history. And this is really, um, you know, something that should terrify us all. I know that the TV show has driven The Handmaid's Tale back into the popular consciousness and it's become a trending topic. But I have to tell you that reading it is enough for me. Um, I don't think that I can add that visual element to the narrative and watch all of this be performed. It's just too much. So that's all to say that I've not seen the series and I don't think I ever will. Um, I would love to hear what your thoughts are on the show and, you know, how it compares to the novel in the comments if you are willing to share. Now, Gilead is a theocratic state, meaning that it is run by religious law. It is a patriarchal, misogynistic society that maintains its power through panopticism and the suppression of individuality, knowledge, and education. And if you're not familiar with the term panopticism, it's essentially the idea that we will self-police in light of the fact that the possibility of surveillance is always there. In other words, you might walk into the grocery store and want to steal that apple, but fearing that there may be five working cameras around you that you can't see, you restrain yourself from committing that crime. And you can see how the handmaids in particular live in fear of the eye and are frequently self-policing as a survival tactic. Gilead has rewritten history to serve its own purposes and controls all information by forbidding any sort of literature and manipulating all media to fit its agenda. Women in particular are harshly subjugated under the sons of Jacob, as the founders of Gilead are called, and they have been stripped of their jobs, autonomy, rights, money, property, and most importantly, their identities, and are now enslaved and repurposed in their new roles based on their status and function to the state. The ants are responsible for indoctrinating the handmaids through violence and abuse. The wives are married to the commanders but are past childbearing age. The Econo wives are married to the working classes but also can't produce children. The Marthas are the wives' servants and the handmaids with whom we are most concerned are the two-legged wombs as Offred describes them who are assigned to and identified by a specific commander with whom they live and most importantly with whom they must partake in a monthly ritualized rape so that the handmaid may procreate for the sterile couple. Handmaids then have been reduced to their reproductive function and are valued only for their productivity. Fertility and reproduction thus become their only means of worth and survival. Those women who cannot reproduce or who are deemed as nonconformist by the state are dubbed unwomen and are essentially sent to their death in the colonies to clean up toxic waste. There is no use for them. Atwood, of course, is calling attention to yet another way women's bodies and reproductive organs, a threat and a source of real power and control in a patriarchal world, are once again being weaponized against them. Whether it is Shakespeare's Prospero vilifying Sycorax for her ability to reproduce or Dr. Frankenstein piecing together, you know, dead body parts to produce a great race, or whether it is the overturning of Roe versus Wade, there has been a great ongoing struggle to control or possess the one source of power that men simply do not have, reproduction. By reducing women exclusively to this one act and then exerting full control over it, the sons of Jacob partake in a long history of womb envy and render women powerless, defenseless, and totally useless once they are no longer able to fulfill their role as breeders. As I said, Atwood calls the novel speculative fiction. And so this notion of using a handmaid for the purposes of reproduction is an act that we've encountered before in history in at least two major religious texts that I know of, at least twice in the Bible and once in the Mahabharata, um, one of the Hindu epics. And I do want to share this story with you as it only recently came to my attention by theologian and professor Hector Amaya. 
In the epic, a prince, Vayessa, is told by his mother to have children with his deceased brother's wives since there are no heirs to the kingdom. Because the princesses are unwilling but still obedient, all goes awry and they each produce weak children. Vayessa is told to try again, but at this point, the princesses are like, no more of this. Um, and in her stead, one princess gives him her handmaid, and the handmaid willingly obeys and thus produces a rightful heir. And he's very strong, so much so that when he's dropped on a rock with such force, the rock breaks, but the baby is okay. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, this is all about fulfilling one's dharma or your station in life or what's right, because this is how you escape reincarnation. But ultimately, there are consequences in that the three children go to war and destroy one another, thus suggesting that the use of a handmaid is problematic. And a more familiar story to you, most likely, is that of Abram and his wife, Sarai. And for the purposes of ease and clarity, I'm just going to refer to them as Abraham and Sarah, names that are given to them later on in Genesis and by which they're most well known anyway. Um, Yahweh makes a covenant with Abraham, promising him land, protection, and children. But Abraham's wife, Sarah, is old and infertile, which is a source of great humiliation at this time. And it's important to note that though they are both burdened with the pressures and humiliation of barrenness, it is especially shameful for the woman. You'll notice that it's always Sarah who's barren. It's never Abraham. Um, and this is true in The Handmaid's Tale. Patriarchal law dictates that men cannot be deemed infertile. The blame shall always rest on the woman. Time goes on and Abraham grows impatient, waiting for Yahweh's promise of children. Both in their 90s, Abraham and Sarah begin to believe that maybe what Yahweh meant by promising them children is that Abraham just needs to have sex with Sarah's slave, her handmaid, Hagar. Now, just so you know, it was common practice in biblical times for an infertile married woman to give a female servant to her husband in order to produce heirs. But just like in the novel, these children would be considered the wife's. The handmaid truly was, as Offred says, a two-legged womb. That's all, a sacred vessel, an ambulatory chalice. In the Bible, Hagar, Sarah's handmaid, is given to Abraham and is impregnated, and she immediately looks down on Sarah because of it. And this leads to considerable conflict between Sarah and Hagar, namely that Sarah treats Hagar so harshly that Hagar runs away. It's hard not to see the parallels between Sarah and Serena Joy, who, though despicable and of a higher status than Offred, is still a woman oppressed by the Republic of Gilead. Remember, this was a woman who enjoyed the fame of being a gospel singer and who made televised speeches, albeit about how women should remain in the home. And now she's forbidden to read, write, or really do anything but knit. Ironically, she got what she was always promoting, but clearly this was never what she wanted for herself then or now. I mean, if she really believed women's place was in the home, then she wouldn't have been on TV singing and making speeches. Now she's reduced to being forced to watch her husband copulate with another woman and holding her hand while it takes place. And then she has to share her home with this woman, this Hagarian figure. Can you imagine that? And certainly both Sarah and Serena Joy take out their anger and frustration on their respective handmaids and their acts are condemnable, but we need to look at the bigger picture of what being oppressed in a patriarchal society can do to someone. No matter what, we can't ignore the victimization and the brainwashing of all women in The Handmaid's Tale. Now, one of the things we must keep in mind with this biblical story of Hagar is that Hagar is a reproductive vessel for Sarah and Abraham, but she's also a sort of literary vessel for us as readers. Her purpose is to help show the errors of Abraham and Sarah's ways. And I'm not talking about the fact that they use this poor woman for their own reproductive needs, but that they do not obey God and believe he will fulfill his promise. Hagar plays a very small role in the bigger picture, the story of how Abraham becomes the father of many nations. In other words, Hagar's experience is never once considered by Abraham, Sarah, the text, or its readers. The Bible does not ask us to consider her as a human who is essentially being forced to partake in cultural rape so that Abraham and his wife may escape humiliation and continue the bloodline. I would be curious to know how many readers have come across this moment in the Bible and have really taken into consideration Hagar as a human, her thoughts, feelings, and experiences in her role as Sarah's handmaid. And I would be curious to know how many readers have read this act as one of rape. In her novel, Atwood is giving voice and agency to the silenced. Offred is Hagar just thousands of years later. And she has much to say, and we have much to feel for her. 
Now, while it was a culturally acceptable, acceptable in biblical times to use a handmaid for procreation, and while it may seem that the Bible does not condemn this practice, it's notable that there is, as um, Professor Amaya argues, that there's considerable upheaval and tension in the family, all of which are direct consequences of Sarah and Abraham's choice to turn to Hagar as the solution to his childless state. Following the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar is that of Rebekah and Isaac. After praying for children, Rebekah and Isaac are blessed with Jacob and Esau. Now, it's Jacob with whom we are most interested. After all, those in charge of Gilead call themselves the sons of Jacob. God reiterates to Jacob the same promise of protection, land, and children that he made to Abraham. Jacob ultimately ends up, in a rather problematic way, that's a whole other story, with two wives, Leah and Rachel, both of whom um, come with their respective handmaids, Zilpah and Bilhah. Because Jacob favors Rachel, God blesses Leah with fertility so that she is not alone. The first four to five sons are born from her, and then Rachel sees she can't have kids, so she forces her handmaid to have sex with Jacob. And then Leah sees that she hasn't had kids in a while, so she forces her handmaid to have sex with Jacob too. And then finally, Rachel has two kids, Joseph and Benjamin. In the novel, the commander even reads, Behold my maid Bilhah, she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. Now, the crux of the story is not how these slaves are being used and abused by Rachel and Leah to retaliate against one another's fertility, or how these women are taking a seemingly perverse pride in their handmaid's ability to have children for Jacob. It's about the genesis of the 12 tribes of Israel. Never is there a mention of the handmaid outside of her function in Rachel and Leah's narrative. You can read this story and really not pay attention to them at all because these slaves had no rights and the children are um, not theirs anyway. Just as is, um, just, you know, as it is in The Handmaid's Tale. It's at this point you need to recall Janine and the emptiness she feels after having lost her baby. We are told that she has become unhinged. And even though Offred has little sympathy for Janine, it's hard for us not to consider how much pressure is put on these women to conceive. I mean, after all, one reason they are draped in the color red is because it's a sign of fertility. They are like machines forced to revolve their lives around pregnancy and birth and are expected without emotion to give up these children without question. But remember, these women once lived in a free world. They know the love a mother feels for her child. Think about how often Offred thinks and speaks of her um, daughter and the terrible soul-gripping sadness she feels after seeing a photo of her daughter who is now being raised by others and who Offred feels no longer remembers her. This is terrifying, brutalizing, and soulless, and Janine's reaction is normal and understandable. The state will dehumanize these women one way or another. In other words, this whole novel is giving us the perspective of Hagar, Bilhah, and Zilpah. These slaves, these unimportant figures who exist to serve and be useful are too often ignored, marginalized, and forgotten. Let me know your thoughts on the comparison between the handmaids in Atwood's novel and the biblical handmaids I just discussed. And join me for the next video on The Handmaid's Tale in which I discuss the novel in relation to America and the Puritans. The link is below. Thanks for joining me and I will see you guys in the next one.